Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening to the people in the room. Good evening to the people on the Zoom. Um, I'm Leslie Weisenfeld. I have the truly happy privilege of not only being the uh, Chief of Psychiatry here at Sinai Health, but also hosting everyone here and introducing the event. Um, and mainly what I wanted just to say a few things before I introduce Dr. Mossant is to say that um, at the risk of stealing what I'm sure you will say as well, Benoit, this is one of the, if not the most kind of happy professional occasions. So it is such a pleasure to be together in person and on Zoom and um, really celebrating Dr. Paula Ravitz. There are many people in the room who um, are warmly connected to Paula in all sorts of ways, family, friends, um, colleagues, uh, collaborators. Uh, and yet here on behalf of Sinai Health, we have the ability and I have the ability to say that we are happy to claim Paula as ours um, and um, with a lot of gratitude and respect and admiration for all of the work that she's done that people are going to hear about here. Um, although you'll hear from my um, our colleague as well, Dr. Mullen Lesh, later in the event, I do want to also acknowledge that I'm happy to be here with another previous chief of psychiatry um, from Sinai Health and um, it's just such a lovely thing to be together and realize all the connections that we have all together. Um, that allow for us to both celebrate and uh, and learn from what uh, Paula is going to share with us um, this evening. So thank you all for being here and um, glad to be here myself. Dr. Malsand is here as the chair of the University of Toronto um, uh, Psychiatry and also the Labatt chair um, of the Department of Psychiatry. And he will give a much more formal and and um, grand um, introduction to Paula as she deserves. Uh, and then we'll hear from Paula about her career and all of the many things that she has done and shared and grown um, on her way to becoming a professor in psychiatry. And then we're really lucky to, to have uh, friends and family also give some um, of their own tributes to Paula. So it should be a really lovely event. And um, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna ask closely uh, Paula in your, um, in your wonderful um, accomplishments. So congratulations. Thank, thank you, Leslie. And I want to echo your welcome to Paula and more importantly to the family members who are here to celebrate their promotion to professor at the University of Toronto. And I understand that people came from far away to participate in what you characterize is indeed the joyous event. As I said, it's uh, the evening. We don't bicker, we don't criticize, we just uh, celebrate. So, and as you said, my uh, role um, in this is to do the formal kind of summary of why uh, Professor Rabbits was promoted to professor. And I have an eight page letter. And I'm going to, so that would take probably. Well, I'm sorry, but it works everywhere else, so. It's to mute. Oh, yeah. The, no, I don't know if normally, uh, the host is Rachel Delaney, who is uh, remotely. So Rachel, if you as the host can mute everybody else, that would be great. I think we're also recording this. And if uh, Dr. Ravitz agreed, it will go on your YouTube channel. And I think it's a nice thing for people to be able to go back and look at particularly the tribute offered by other people after the lecture. But Dr. Ravitz will describe her own trajectory, but I'm going to do it in a more formal way, to summarize for you what she did and what uh, earned her, her promotion. And I will try to do it in uh, six, seven minutes, but it's fairly long, so I warn you in advance. So it starts with Dr. Ravitz completing an undergraduate studies at the University of Michigan in 1974. And then she got a BA with specialized honor in dance at York University in 1977, followed by her medical degree at McMaster University in 1995. And she was telling me about that, that gap that where she danced for many years. And I hope we hear more about this. And then she does her psychiatry residency training at the University of Toronto in 2000. She has also completed some advanced interprofessional psychotherapy training, IPT, at the University of Pittsburgh, 
the late 90s, early 2000, a graduate studies course at the University of Toronto and uh, some at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and then again, uh, other courses. She was first appointed as a lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto when she graduated from a residency in 2000, promoted to assistant professor in 2003, and then promoted to associate professor in 2010, leading to this promotion uh, in 2022. And what I'm talking about is uh, we are back in February, uh, uh, actually in July 2021, so more than two years ago. So when, and I'm giving you the dossier, a summary of the dossier. So Dr. Ravid John Mount Sinai Hospital, Sinai Health, and at that time, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health Chemage as a staff psychiatrist in 2000. And she became appointed the director of the Mount Sinai Psychotherapy Institute in 2004 and became a clinician scientist in the Tannenbaum Lindenfeld Research Institute in 2015. In the past, she has also held other university appointment and position. And I just want to mention the Morgan Firestone Psychotherapy Chair that she held from 2011 to 2021. And she was also the clinical head of the IPC clinic at Cambridge from 2000 to 2017. 2007, sorry. Uh, the core of her appointment was her creative professional activities, and those have been dedicated to improving access, care, quality, and outcomes for people living with depression and other mental disorder. And she accomplished it through knowledge translation, innovative training and treatment delivery model, and advancement of evidence-supported psychotherapy practices, both locally and globally. And uh, I'm going to give you a few highlights, but I'm sure we'll hear much more about all this during your lecture. So for instance, uh, she authored with a group of colleagues a series of six books and videos called Psychotherapy Essential to Go. She uh, has been involved in a psychotherapy RCT with perinatal depressed women, and I see several other people in this room involved. And it's all very exciting because I think we are like 10 people from finishing and rolling more than 1,200. And then, more importantly, we'll be able to analyze the data. Life in academia is a life of a delayed gratification. You have to learn patience and to wait. So, you know, it takes many years, but so very important psychotherapy trial. And I know at Sinai she played a major role and she's preparing uh, to play a major role in the follow up. So, she also, uh, as I mentioned, has played a role in advancing interpersonal psychotherapy dissemination and practice, IPT, including participating in the CANMAT guideline, many publications related to this. Uh, in terms of, up, she also worked on a series of projects to improve or optimize therapeutic alliances to improve care outcome. And in particular, what has been called the Signature Workshop for a novel hybrid of relational theories to recognize and repair therapeutic alliance tension at therapeutic opportunities in clinical care. <sighs> That's a mouthful. And she has used various techniques in particular to achieving psychotherapy effectiveness curriculum. And all this led to an international reputation, which is a requirement to be promoted to professor including, for instance, as evidence of uh, international reputation or leadership with the Interpersonal Society of Interpersonal Therapy, ISIPT, and she was the vice president. She was a co-chair of their conference, and I remember when they met in Toronto, she was then the president uh, of this prestigious organization from 2017 to 2019. She has been an invited course director, and she, of course, is a past president of the organization. She also has been a member of the World Psychiatric Association Special Interest Group on IPT Cultural Adaptation. And I expect we'll hear again more about that very interesting work. In addition to CPA work, she has done uh, research and she has been an inv a principal investigator, a co-PI, 
co-principal investigator or co-investigator collaborator in 16 grants with total funding of uh, more than 20 million. And those grants have been funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, CHR, Grand Challenge Canada, the AFP Innovation Award, the Patient Center Outcome Research Institute, PICO in the US, and uh, something called eCampus Ontario. And maybe she will tell us more about it, because I don't know what it is. She has published 33 peer review article in leading journal in psychiatry, for example, the British Journal of Psychiatry, the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, and the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. She also has published six books, three book chapter, and three manual as of two years ago. I'm sure she has done more since then. So all this created a dossier that we sent to very prestigious and prominent uh, external reviewer who provide a secret review. So she doesn't know who those people are and she will never know. Uh, there are very few people who know. So, but I can tell you looking at the name that for those of you who know psychotherapy would immediately recognize the name. So I'm going to give you a quote from those uh, very prominent people. Uh, so one said, I strongly endorse this promotion based on her excellence in creative professional activities and in teaching, Dr. Rabbit is an internationally highly respected authority in psychotherapy. Another one said, uh, where is my second quote? Paula is one of the most respected members of the interpersonal psychotherapy community. I will give you more quotes to conclude. As mentioned by your external referee, she has been extremely uh, intensively involved in education, and you're not going to be surprised that she's actively taught an annual workshop in IPT to a resident, plus multiple psychotherapy sessions to PG-1, 1, 2, and 5 as part of their core curriculum. She has also personally supervised over 80 residents in IPT and nine of whom have become IPT clinical faculty at U of T. So she's really working for the patient of today, but also the patient of tomorrow by preparing the next generation. Beyond the University of Toronto, she has presented invited workshop and course for psychiatry residency all across Canada, Queens, Western Ontario, University of Montreal, Alberta, uh, but also internationally, so in the US at the University of Pittsburgh, in Ethiopia at the University of Addis Ababa, in Israel uh, at the, the Baruch Ike Care School of Psychology and, uh, and um, other places. At the level of graduate level, she has been involved in PhD committee and master committee, and I've already mentioned her involvement in continued professional education practice development. That, and that uh, work has led her to receiving several prestigious awards at the University of Toronto, and I'm only going to mention three of them. The Ivan Silver Award for Excellence in Continuing Professional Development, the Colin Wolf Award for Long, term contribution to continuing education and the Ivan Silver Award for Excellence in Continuing Mental Health Education. And uh, we, as part of the promotion, solicit, again, letter of support from former students, and I'm going to read you uh, three quotes from three students. One said, Dr. Rabbit is an excellent teacher, expert in psychotherapy research, international leader, in IPT and has had a profound impact on my development as a psychiatry therapist and IPT supervisor. Maybe you are in the room and you know who you are, but I don't have your name. Another one said, Dr. Rabbit has gone above and beyond in supporting me in my career trajectory, in advocating for the place of psychotherapy in healthcare and in psychotherapy research and innovation. Dr. Rabbit is a rare combination of kind, generous, intelligent, outworking, thoughtful, humble, and very effective in your teaching, leadership, and work. 
Another person said, I do not consider Dr. Arvist as a supervisor, but a mentor. She helped maximize my independence as a senior trainee while providing appropriate support and guidance. She taught me both the art and science of IPT. So in summary, all those accomplishments led to a um, uh, consensus that she needed to be promoted to professor. And it's uh, captured by one last quote from one of those very prominent external peer referee. My own judgment is that Paula is exceptional, both in terms of scholarship and professional work, and that any institution would be lucky to count her as a member. She's by all accounts a superb teacher and clinician, and her scholarly work has impact on the international scene. I know that she is highly regarded by the best and the brightest of the IPT community, and that the students she has trained all her in very high regard. She has demonstrated excellence in both her scholarship and her professional work, and I recommend her promotion with real enthusiasm. So, on that very nice quote, let's all welcome Professor Rabbits. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Leslie and Benoit for those generous introductions and everyone for being here in person. And for those of you who are joining us online as I share some reflections on my journey, both personally and professionally. But before I begin, I want to, um, with gratitude and respect, acknowledge that I'm presenting from Takaranto the traditional land of many First Nations and continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Each time I acknowledge the traditional land taken from Indigenous peoples, it's a reminder for us, for me, to reflect on our relationships with Indigenous peoples, my commitment to protecting the environment, and my action in solidarity to dismantle ongoing colonialism, racism, structural violence, and other forms of social injustices that disproportionately impact Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities in Canada and across the globe. So, um, here, I'm trying to advance this. Oh, it's not working. There we go. Okay. Here are my disclosures and a little bit of a agenda. I am very grateful to many people who have supported my professional development. Many of you are here in the room. And I'm going to share a little bit about me in earlier chapters of my life. As Benoit described, my creative professional activities and my role as an academic physician have been focused on capacity building, implementation and teaching of evidence supported psychotherapy practices in order to improve both mental health care access and outcomes. So before proceeding further, I'm sure many of you are curious about the title of this talk. And I'm gonna give you a quick lesson in the history of contemporary dance. Prior to entering medicine, I had a career in dance as a choreographer, performer, and teacher. And I'm really excited that some of my colleagues are in the room with, with us today, Denise Fujiwara and Alan and Karen Keja. And I trained in differing techniques of American pioneering contemporary dance artists from the US, including Martha Graham and Jose Limon, stylistically different in how their dancers trained and performed. And I was also among the early adopters in Canada of a form of dance called contact improvisation where rather than training dancers to replicate the techniques and stylized choreographed movement sequences of others, it instead focuses on training dancers to improvise. In the case of contact improvisational dance, this involved improvising and dancing with others, akin to jazz music. In contact, a duet dance form, you're trained to become aware of your and your partner's centers of gravity, and with that awareness to use centrifugal forces in a state of flow, where right side up is as comfortable as upside down, free associating with discoveries as you find yourself in unplanned surprising places, supporting or being supported, safely falling, and sometimes in flight. 
I learned this form of dance from the late Nancy Stark Smith, pictured on the right of the screen with Steve Paxton perched on her shoulder, with his center of gravity placed above hers. These two were the founders of this dance form. And I'm gonna show you a brief film clip with Nancy. I'm sure you haven't seen anything like this at rounds before. And you'll likely wonder what this has to do with clinical practice or teaching. But as I see it, the improvisational practice is central to what we do clinically and to the ability to reflect in action. So I'm just gonna, I might need Paolo's help here. Okay, and here we go. So this clip you'll see of Nancy, it's under a minute long. She's in the orange shirt and you'll see um, that there's dancers around the room. They're all jamming. So that's what that's, that's, they call it, compact improvisational jam. So it's improvising. And you'll see her, this is narrated by, by Steve Paxton. So I'll let him explain it. We are looking at performance of contact improvisation, a duet movement form. This tape takes a sweeping look over 11 years of practice by Nancy Stark Smith from her first exposure to the form I was working on when it was new in 1972, through moments chosen from consecutive years of performing with me, Steve Paxton, and with others. We are looking at performance of contact and pro <laughs> There it was, okay. So a little taste of contact improvisation. And Alan and Karen have told me that if there's time, they'll come and do a live demo for us at the <laughs> end. Okay, so here on the left are my brothers on a snowy day in the suburbs of Detroit. And here they are in the front row <laughs> and our late parents pictured on the right. Um, I'm very grateful to my family and brothers and niece who are here today visiting. Um, our parents were children of immigrants. Our mom grew up in an inner city neighborhood of Detroit and she was raised by a single mom, which was pretty unusual for the time. When younger, she helped to support her family selling photographic equipment at the local department store, Sam's Cut Rate by day and developing photographs of jazz club patrons in Detroit by night. She valued independence, which was needed for survival and hard work and creativity. And our father was an optometrist who worked in a neighboring factory town, beloved by his multi-generational patients, kind, patient, always hopeful. When I was in high school, I became exposed to contemporary dance and joined a, a group called the Young Dancers Guild, where I was introduced to American contemporary dance artists and techniques. And this interest continued for me as a young adult. I entered the University of Michigan where I did undergrad medical pre-med studies, but I also continued to study dance. And in the middle of my third year, I left school and moved to New York City, which was a mecca for uh, contemporary dance in order to train at some of the kind of contemporary dance studios there. Eventually found my way back to Toronto to study at the Toronto Dance Theater, finished my undergrad degree at York where there was a really strong program in the performing arts where I met my husband along with Denise Fujiwara and um, we formed a dance company and that was my first career. As mentioned, we were among the early adopters of contact improv in Canada. And with grant funding from arts councils, we choreographed, performed, toured and taught improvisation, including at the professional training program of Toronto Dance Theater and several university dance departments. Fast forward to starting a family as a working parent of our two wonderful daughters, I started thinking about switching careers and with the help from my family and the Dancer Transition Resource Center, an organization that helped professional dancers to retrain Against some odds, I gained entry to McMaster University Medical School when our youngest daughter would have been entering grade one. So why psychiatry? I was inspired during med school in electives with a guy named Bob Hading who did outreach. And uh, he was treating complex patients with severe and persistent mental illnesses in shelters and drop-in clinics. And this was before inner city health associates existed. And as well, I was inspired by Ivan Silver, a geriatric psychiatrist and educational scholar. 
So why psychotherapy? I found that like dance, that the practice of psychotherapy was both technical and creative. There was an art and science to it and it appealed because it was effective and in clinical encounters, improvisational. I was inspired by many, many psychotherapy supervisors, including many of you in the room. I, I can't mention all of my teachers, but um, Dr. Mullen Lesh, John Hunter, Graham Taylor, Rex Kay, Gary Roden, Lori Gillis, and Ellen Frank from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center who uh, taught me IPT. As well, I was inspired by some of the educational scholars in our department, Brian Hodges and Ivan Silver, and I became interested in ways to leverage my, to kind of combine my interest in psychotherapy at the same time as finding ways to improve um, both clinical outcomes and access to evidence-supported care. I like this quote, I often use it when I'm teaching uh, from, the, from John Bowlby, who was the father of attachment theory, that the reflective practice of psychotherapy, it requires intuition, imagination, and empathy, but also a firm grasp of what the patient's problems are, what the goals are of treatment, and what we're trying to do, the tasks. We're trying to connect with our patients to understand them and to help them. And at a process level, the teaching and clinical practice of psychotherapy and mental health care felt similar and aligned to improvisational dance, duetting, focused on connecting, reflecting in, ag in action with non-judgmental authenticity, presence, empathy, and attention to alliances. So here is um, a big picture of some of the things to follow. When we talk about the therapeutic alliance, we often talk about three elements, that there needs to be a trusting bond, but as well, there needs to be clarity and agreement about what are the goals and what are the tasks to achieve those goals. So for me, the kind of synchronous um, similarity was that I had a trusting bond with some wonderful colleagues and we were aligned in our goals and shared values to improve access and outcomes of both patient and relationship-centered care. So when I entered psychiatry, this is kind of where we were at. There were varying schools of psychotherapy taught in our department, psychodynamics, CBT, DBT, group, IPT, I was drawn to IPT because it was about relationships and helping people to navigate distressing interpersonal experiences. Similar to the trajectory of all the evidence-supported psychotherapies, the sequence of IPT research began with establishing that it worked in controlled settings with randomized controlled trials for depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD. And I entered the field after efficacy and effectiveness had been established. And I was interested in finding ways to improve outcomes in the real world with complex patients and extend its reach with dissemination. So why IPT, the case of IPT? It was evidence supported and consensus guidelines based on hundreds of well-conducted RCTs across the lifespan with children, adolescents, women during pregnancy and in the postpartum, adults and in late life. And it was also um, studied and used in many different settings, including in low and middle income countries and with underserved clinical populations. It was relationally focused with guidelines, improvisational scores, if you will, for working through universal, commonly occurring stressful life events of loss, grief, um, social role transitions or life changes, role disputes or disagreements in relationships, and, uh, and interpersonal sensitivity or deficits. And it's always making links between relational experiences and what's going on inside, emotions, affect, um, but also behaviorally, the kind of tip of the interpersonal iceberg is a focus on communication. Sometimes it's, as Molin taught me, the acts of commission, but sometimes it's the acts of omission, what's left unsaid or how things are said that can lead to problems. So I was interested in how and why IPT worked or didn't and how we might improve outcomes and access. 
And um, although IPT was influenced at its inception by the work and writings of Bowlby and attachment theory, the primary focus seemed to be on delivering standardized protocols, therapeutic strategies, with little emphasis on theory or explanatory models. IPT instructs therapists to attend to links, as I've mentioned, between interpersonal experiences and symptoms, provides helpful manualized gu uh, guidelines. But I was interested in how some of the relationally focused theories might help us better understand and help patients with individual differences beyond their DSM-5 diagnosis, differences with respect to trauma histories, with respect to background and ethnicity and culture. So I'm gonna be mentioning attachment theory and other parts of this lecture. So I wanna just provide some brief background for those who aren't familiar with it. Attachment theory emphasizes how close relationships are critical for our survival, growth, development, well-being, and patterns of relating or attachment styles that can contribute to problems in interpersonally or resilience. And I learned about attachment theory from John Hunter and Bob Maunder. And with Bill Lancey, we did um, a review of attachment measures a number of years ago. And we used one of these measures in some process research we did at uh, CAMH, in which we looked at changes in attachment and um, patterns of relating in patients who were depressed, who had partial response or full response or no response. And we found kind of a little clue about how IPT might work, that IPT works by helping people move towards attachment security and to regain a sense of self-efficacy or agency along with becoming less disengaged and more affiliative in their relationships. More recently, I learned about and trained in the use of another relationally focused model. It was both a theory actually and a treatment, mentalizing, um, by Fonagy and Bateman. And I have been adopting and integrating these therapeutic principles into my practice and teaching and with Rosalind Law, who was similarly integrating mentalizing and IPT with Fonagy in the UK and with Claire Payne here in Toronto, we embarked on defining our discoveries and recommendations in a clinical paper on synergies of IPT and mentalizing, especially useful for patients with interpersonal sensitivities and deficits. And we're hoping this paper will add to conversations about IPT and be useful for others to use in teaching and learning. And for those who aren't familiar with mentalizing, it involves making inferences to understand what might be in our own and others' minds. Um, what uh, Jeremy Holmes described as seeing ourselves from the, seeing others from the inside, which is empathy, but more than that, also seeing ourselves from the outside. When we experience others demonstrating and communicating care and understanding, it serves to develop an ability for reflective functioning and to mentalize, to learn from social experience, to learn from and with others, something called epistemic trust. It's important for interpersonal effectiveness and arguably for survival and optimal functioning to be able to understand and predict my, what might be in others in our own minds for perspective taking, empathy, resilience, and the forming and sustaining of relationships. So moving on to uh, talking a little bit about access, why was it important to me? This was an issue being highlighted in the literature. There was a series in the Lancet published long ago, Vikram Patel and Martin Prince headlined, No Health Without Mental Health. And people were becoming increasingly aware that mental illnesses globally were undertreated and a public health problem. And so, one way to potentially address this and try to improve treatment access was through training and capacity building, including with, it, including using task shifting with frontline providers at the foundation of step care in underserved settings. So as uh, Benoit had described, um, a group of us uh, here at Mount Sinai Hospital and with faculty from the University of Toronto, we got together and we created a curriculum where we tried to use evidence-based teaching of evidence-based therapies. Um, we did, we used the curriculum. There was, um, it was case-based, interactive. There were quizzes, there were lesson plans, answer guides, uh, take-home practice reminders. 
And um, we use these in a number of uh, different settings, including in Northern Ontario with uh, Canadian Mental Health Association clinics that were staffed by people who had maybe a few years post-secondary education. And they were tasked with seeing patients with a lot of complexity where there were no psychiatrists, right? And uh, we got terrific feedback. We showed that they improved in their knowledge and skills. And, um, and it's subsequently been used in a number of, you know, different, uh, parts of the books and the curriculum in um, CBT, IPT, motivational interviewing, and um, DBT for emotion regulation, along with kind of a, a book on the common factors. It's, it's been used in several different projects. I'm gonna tell you about two of them. So many of you here know about TAP and TAC, the Toronto Addis Ababa Psychiatry Program and the Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Collaboration. I was one of many U of T faculty to co-teach psychiatry residents at Addis Ababa University. I've taught eight times in the past umpteen years and six of those eights involved going over for um, a month in teams of three. A bit of background on TAP. Ethiopian psychiatric researchers, Dr. Zatel Alem, Masvin Araya, Abdul Rashid Bekri, and others expanded psych services from one hospital department in 2003 to six regional university departments with now over 100 psychiatrists. In 2003, 20 years ago, when this program was founded, there were nine psychiatrists, all foreign trained. Now there are over 100 who've been trained in Ethiopia for the vast majority. Plus there are nurses and psychologists and health officers and traditional healers where all patients go for mental health care. Psychiatrists in developing countries become clinicians, mental health experts, teachers, researchers, public health specialists in developing needed infrastructure for mental health services and advocates. With, um, with others, with Dr. Dawit Wandamagian, who's here in the audience, who was a, the chief resident the first time I went to Ethiopia in 2006 and is now a faculty member and a respected leader in global mental health. Um, and Claire Payne, Edward McAnanama, Lori Gillis and others. Um, we taught IPT. We taught and tried to adapt it with and for our Ethiopian colleagues in the context of capacity building. I was armed in 2006 with a manual for a study that had been done in Uganda that's since been published by the World Health Organization. I had little knowledge of the Ethiopian health and mental health care systems. And I was honestly uncertain whether IPT and the idea of a talking therapy would be helpful or relevant. But there did seem to be some face validity in the IPT focus on relationships that were central to the fabric of life of, in, in Ethiopia and to these focal areas of loss, change, and, dis and disagreements as being associated with onset or worsening of episodes of illness. In 2011, Dawit and I conducted a focus group sponsored by the Ethiopian Psychiatric Association with 25 psychiatrists in Ethiopia. Now there's over 100, but back in 2011, there were 25. In order to discuss traditions or practices surrounding the IPT focal areas and how the IPT approaches and ideas of resolving these interpersonal problems differed from, complemented, might be compatible or might be not acceptable with traditional practices of managing stressful life events and whether we could engage patients in treatment in ways that were feasible, helpful, culturally, culturally sensitive and non-stigmatizing. This led to the Biaber Project, an implementation, implementation study um, that was led by uh, Dawit and Claire and others in uh, colleagues in Ethiopia. And prior to this project, there was no mental health screening or treatment in primary care. Um, what happened in this scale up was um, psychiatrists were trained to be trainers who then trained mid-level mental health workers, psychologists and psych nurses, who then trained primary care nurses. So there was task shifting to these non-specialist frontline health providers with hands-on mentoring to transfer classroom learning to practical skills. And we created um, a, a nine modules of training, four of them were on IPT, including on kind of mental health literacy screening, discrimination, domestic violence, safety issues, including um, screening for childhood sexual and physical abuse and the um, 
uh, alcohol misuse and suicide. And although our metrics of success were good, we trained over 500 nurses, over 30,000 patients were screened in 18 clinics, five cities, 1,200 patients were treated, and it's been since used in several other projects in uh, primary care in Addis and student health center and in refugee camps. I think that uh, bringing a critical lens to our work in retrospect, though the project was successful, it's important to note that health professional education, including cultural adaptations of psychotherapy exported through randomized controlled trials and implementation in low income countries can unwittingly teach Western culture laden ideas, values, assumptions and practices that are not always relevant or sensitive to differing clinical populations and settings. Doctors Wanda Magian, Payne, Whitehead, and others have recently published on the importance of revisioning mental health care in Africa with recognition of traditional healers for all patients first go. So alongside the need to increase access, there was also a need to find ways to improve outcomes. We learned the most from treatment failures, I think. And I became interested in understanding individual patient differences and why patients might drop out, not engage, not recover, not comply. Most psychotherapy studies are conducted with stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria that, such that the patients aren't reflective of the kind of patients we see in the real world who have complexity, severity, comorbidity. And as a psychiatrist, we often see people who failed other treatments. So one of the questions we had was why therapies might fail to achieve the goals, even when the therapists are being adherent with fidelity to the protocols of a treatment model, and how psychotherapies worked in real world, real world settings for patients. So the literature on delivery agents, um, the therapists, revealed large differences between effective therapists and those who were ineffective with respect to patient improvements and recovery versus deterioration rates or dropout. And this fueled our interest to define, practice, study, and teach about common factors shown to mediate outcomes, regardless of the modality. And one of these common factors is therapeutic alliance, which robustly predicts clinical outcomes more than kind of fidelity to a model. So um, this led to another phase of work with colleagues here at Mount Sinai, the sixth book in the Psychotherapy Essentials to Go uh, curricular series, which was an integration of relational theories and practices to improve outcomes across all models of therapy. And it was relationship-centered. Individuals from our group brought differing expertise and perspectives. Mole and Lesh from group psychotherapy, John and Bob from CL psychiatry and attachment experts, Claire Payne, who is an expert in psychodynamic and psychoanalytic therapy and trauma and cultural informed care, and I brought the IPT lens. So together we taught many times and over, it was almost like we, we had all these puzzle pieces on the ground and eventually we found a way for them to fit together with an integrated theory that used attachment, mentalizing, trauma, and culturally informed care principles to enhance alliances and outcomes. Our model highlights how problems and alliances can represent maladaptive patterns of relating grounded in unresolved developmental trauma and insecure attachment, but they can be therapeutically repaired. So this was a way to empower the therapeutic process with new tools. There's been a lot of research on the common factors that run across all these different models of psychotherapy, and they have been found to mediate outcomes and they need to be deliberately taught and used. And I'm very pleased to say that, you know, I contributed to the CANMET guidelines, not only in writing about IPT, but in getting these common factors in there. So um, I'm going to now talk a little bit about um, repairing alliance ruptures. So here is our model. It's a bit busy and we don't have time for me to go over it in detail. Those who are interested can read our book. Um, but the idea is that um, when things aren't going well, it's actually an important moment to kind of step back and reflect and think 
use theory in order to analyze what is or isn't happening. Think about, is there agreement on the goals and tasks? Is there um, an alliance rupture? Um, so we use theory to kind of organize an understanding and then using mentalizing and other therapeutic principles, we find ways to therapeutically repair. So to detect and therapeutically repair these ruptures so that the idea is that these stumbling blocks are actually stepping stones to recovery. So this is, you know, when you look at the contributions to effective psychotherapy, we were looking at therapist effects and how that interacted with client effects. So we've used this model in two studies with George Tasca and the Canadian Psychotherapy Practice Research Network. Um, it was founded by Giorgio Tasca and it, it's comprised of over 2000 community-based therapists in Canada. And in the first of our studies, we used the Achieving Psychotherapy Effectiveness curriculum um, and trained therapists in these kind of interpersonally informed skills to improve attunement with patients and emerging problems in the Alliance. But an important challenge that we're trying to address in the second study in healthcare is to better serve our BIPOC and LGBTQ patients with an emphasis on accessibility and accountability. This next study, which we're just on the cusp of beginning, also funded by um, CIHR, compares group workshop foundational training to case-based interactive online teaching with branching scenarios using our curriculum with additional training in alliance ruptures related to racial and homophobic microaggressions with an expanded team that includes Monica Williams, who's the Canada Research Chair in Mental Health Disparities, Frank Ajik at CAMH, she, who is an EDI expert, and Matthew Sinta, who specializes in LGBTQ health. So I'm coming towards the end. <laughs> Task shifting involves the redistribution of tasks to individuals within a healthcare team who might have fewer qualifications that conventionally were not within their scope of work. This has historically been done in many low and middle income countries in order to scale access to health, where treatment might be delivered by nurses or health officers rather than specialists in, in um, mental health psychiatrists or psychologists. And now increasingly task shifting is done to scale access to care in high income countries, training frontline providers as we earlier did with the Psychotherapy Essentials to Go curriculum in Northern Ontario community-based clinics. It is a recognized foundation of stepped care and aligned with my values and experiences of taking, having great pleasure and enjoyment in training non-specialist providers and community-based clinicians. In light of my interest and focus uh, in attachment theory and relationship-centered care, a clinical population that I was drawn to working with and helping were women with perinatal depression. And I'm currently um, uh, really enjoying practicing with the perinatal mental health team here at Mount Sinai Hospital. And I've had opportunity to participate in two randomized control trials as a clinical lead. The first was led by Cindy Lee Dennis, who's here in the audience, in which um, Sophie Gregoriadis and I were the clinical leads. And we used nurse-delivered telephone IPT. So not only was it task shifting, but it was also looking at kind of the delivery vector, in this case, by telephone. And the second underway is led by Daisy Singla with a large team in Toronto, Chicago, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So um, as mentioned, my role in both of these RCTs is as a clinical lead, and we are training mainly OB nurses and some midwives, those are the non-specialists, in um, behavioral activation, but with attention to the common factors, therapeutic alliances, and an appreciation of individual patient differences. So um, the SUMMIT trial, SUMMIT stands for Scaling Up Maternal Mental Health Care by Increasing Access to Treatment, is a multi-site RCT with a huge team. And I wanna draw your attention to both the upper right and the bottom left corners of um, the screen. The red arrow, this will be the largest psychotherapy trial to our knowledge in the history of our field. And on the bottom left, you'll see the ethnicity of the patients served in this trial, that around 50% of them are BIPOC. 
and which is kind of unusual for RCTs in research, and we're very proud of that. In this study, um, the specialists, it, patients are randomly assigned to either get treatment from a mental health specialist. In Toronto, there's psychiatrists, Chapel Hill, there are psychologists, Chicago, there's social workers, or a trained non-specialist health provider, which are mainly nurses and midwives. And as well, they're randomly assigned to get either in-person care or by televideo. Now, COVID happened in the midst of this trial. So we had to suspend in-person uh, treatment for a period of time, um, but we were 99% recruited. And, and um, you know, we only have like around 10 more patients to go, which is quite extraordinary. And here are two of just many, many papers that have come out of this trial. Not only are we looking at outcomes, we're also looking at processes. And Daisy has a terrific uh, team of qualitative research scientists. Um, and uh, it's just been such a lot of fun and so rewarding to see the patients get better, but also to work with the nurses. Um, so I'm going to, uh, this is the last kind of content slide, um, circling back to IPT. Um, I'm very excited about this kind of current development in project to further scale IPT training access. Again, using evidence-based teaching of an evidence-based therapy, but also technology-assisted online teaching. I developed the content with clinical experts, beta tested it with educators and trainers and um, clinicians and EDI specialists. And um, we emphasize both modality specific therapeutic guidelines of IPT and no surprise, some of the things that I've been talking about, the importance of therapeutic alliances, of use of the common factors, and of appreciating our patients as people um, and considering the role of culture and um, trauma, history of trauma. We tested this um, in uh, here at U of T with psychiatry residents who were who were randomly assigned to get either training as usual or self-directed training, oops, using um, the online course. And um, we have, I'm just in the process of writing up, but we've had very good outcomes. So good, we've done both learner and patient outcomes. So we recruited patients who were matched to the residents and their depression remitted and uh, the residents became equally more skilled and more knowledgeable, whether they were training as usual or doing the self-directed online training. And we're now leveraging this prototype and creating a MOOC, massive open access online Coursera course sponsored by the Faculty of Medicine. And it should be um, available probably in the next month. So, um, Reflecting on this, on all of these activities and kind of doing, preparing for this talk has helped me to recognize the art and science of relationship-centered practice, that it requires us to have an ability to improvise for adaptive expertise, and that our clinical practices and teaching can be strengthened and informed by both theory and research. From my training in psychiatry, psychotherapy, and early in life in contact improvisational dance, guided by curiosity and caring, I learned how you can find yourself in unexpected places with the glass ceiling disappearing when working collaboratively. And just a few kind of closing comments. I think for access, not only do we need really good training, but we also need policymakers and funders to get behind um, these treatments in order to truly make them available. And although the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program has done a great job of increasing access to CBT, no one treatment works for all people. And it's my hope that IPT might eventually be included. When we're teaching and doing knowledge translation, we really need to think instead about knowledge exchange. Um, I've already commented on that earlier. And for outcomes beyond diagnosis and disease, we need to individualize we need to be aware of our individual patient differences and to use the common factors and recognize the importance of alliances in our relationship-centered care. So um, I'm just going to um, 
show you one more video. I might need your help, Connie, to get back to the desktop. Okay, so um, this is around a 30 second video clip of a dancer that you might recognize who employed some principles of contact improvisational dance in her movement sequences in a piece choreographed by Tama Sobel. Tuned and responsive to shifting centers of what's grave, gravity. In clinical care, it's symptoms, problems, the environment, health and education systems and relationships. With presence, care, technical skill, and all the empathy that we have, reflecting in action around choice points with an openness and responsiveness in clinical practice. It is my hope that, you know, for some of you young trainees and early career um, call and mid-career colleagues that you can be guided by your curiosity and caring and find ways to engage, understand, learn from and with your patients and colleagues to improve alliances and outcomes, to partner, catch, lift, and help one another in paths to recovery, resilience, coping, and well-being. So um, I have many people to thank, my family, my husband, our daughters, my brothers, our late parents, my teachers, mentors, and colleagues um, here, the hospital, Department of Psychiatry, Leslie, Sammy Bath, the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute, TAP and TAC, the International Society of IPT and that community of practice, Faculty of Medicine and Department of Psychiatry, and my students and patients. And, and uh, the Dancer Transition Resource Center, who kind of believed in me way back then and helped me to go back to school and gain entry to medicine. So I will end with that. <laughs> Congratulations, Paula. We'd never want to interrupt a standing ovation. Um, we hope you could feel everybody's warmth and attention. There are some more people who would like to share some things. Um, Dr. Stephen Campbell, Paula's husband, is going to speak first and welcome you up here to say a few words. Um, what could I possibly? Uh, they have for that, but I, I will just, uh, you know, give you a little uh, from my side of the story a little bit. Uh, the, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to meet in university and uh, we were from incredibly different backgrounds. I grew up on a small farm in Northern Ontario and Paula was a, a city girl from Detroit, but, you know, we shared dreams, we shared aspirations and we got together and uh, we, and uh, Paula was a fabulous dancer and she was being so successful in her dance career and I and it's so nice to see her dance friends here tonight and you know she one of the things is, uh, that I'll share with you uh, was that when she applied for grants and which were highly you know hard to get every grant she applied for she received uh, she has such support from her community and so when she said to me after we had our second child uh, you know honey I'm thinking about going back to school, I'm wondering, well, you know, why would you want to leave this, you know, this career, this beautiful career you have? And, and but then, and she says, well, why you want to go to med school? And someone mentioned the fact that she was humble. So we've had a couple of kids and we've been knowing each other for a long time. And this is what she tells me. Well, you know, I was the valedictorian in my high school of three or 400 students. Um, you know, I, I probably have a pretty good chance. And so this is the first time she told me. <laughs> You know, it, it, but she was a force in the dance community. So, and, you know, it didn't surprise me that she would be a force in the medical community. And, and it's just like, so I'm mean, so proud of her, our family. And, you know, for our children to see her, to be such an incredible, um, uh, you know, role model. Uh, we have two very, very strong daughters. And I just love to see 
uh, you know, Paul is uh, influence on them. It's been fantastic. And, and for me, you know, as her life partner, it's been just such a great um, uh, to have been married for 45 years, uh, coming together as a really strong team uh, and being, uh, have a great relationship. And, you know, the thing I asked about, about Paula is seeing what she's done so far is I'm really proud of what she's done, but you know, what is she gonna do next? I'll leave you to that. <laughs> I think Dr. Holly Schwartz from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is going to join us through Zoom if Zoom works. Hi, I'm Holly Schwartz in Pittsburgh, and congratulations, Paula. This was such an inspired and inspiring talk from uh, one of the most amazing uh, teachers, thinkers, and clinicians that I've ever had the privilege to work with. So um, Paula and I go back about, uh, I don't know, a couple of decades now, um, and have uh, worked uh, closely together in the IPT community. And, um, I, you know, I can say from personal experiences that uh, learning from Paula uh, teaches you about um, how to be a better therapist, but also I think to be a better person. Uh, her uh, humbleness, as um, uh, Steve mentioned, uh, her uh, gratitude uh, to those around her brings um, communities closer together and helps us work empathically uh, with individuals who are struggling with psychiatric disorders, but also um, with one another as we uh, work collaboratively to address the needs of, uh, of individuals globally. So um, I, I just can't say enough about how grateful I am uh, to have had the opportunity um, to work with Paula in far-flung locations, um, uh, fond memories of being uh, boobies in China. That was a, a particularly fun experience together, um, teaching IPT in China. Uh, and uh, I too am looking forward to the next chapter as her, um, her massive uh, open access online course uh, goes live and uh, she is using her, her brilliance and her compassion to further extend the reach of IPT to the many individuals who I think are eager to learn this modality will no doubt benefit from, from, from learning it. And more importantly, we'll be able to uh, deliver this really wonderful treatment to uh, a whole new group of people. So um, from afar, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I, it is a really great pleasure to have, have heard your work and um, to have uh, been a colleague of yours along the way. So hats off to Paula, congratulations. Are there any tech comments? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Dawit um, Wanda Megan from Addis Ababa University, from TAF and from TAC. I think I'm going to be a, a permanent feature in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a uh, congratulations, Paula. It's uh, my great privilege and honor uh, to say a few words uh, about you. Uh, it's hard to follow Steve again. And he was, it was very hard for him to follow you, and then it's very hard to follow him. Uh, uh, so I met Paula when I was a resident in 2006, when she came out to Ethiopia for the first time. And uh, we heard then that Paula was very unsure of coming out to Ethiopia the first time. And it took a lot of time and convincing uh, by Claire, who doesn't take much to convince people to come out of Ethiopia, but took a, a while with Paula. And Paula has been coming to Ethiopia uh, since then for several times, I think probably next to Claire, Paula will be the second person who has come to Ethiopia to teach. And uh, earlier in her uh, talk, we heard that uh, when we scale up uh, the psychotherapy to primary care, that was uh, the first time that screening for common mental health problems in the in primary care uh, in, in Ethiopia was introduced. What she didn't tell us was IPT was the first time that psychotherapy was introduced to, to begin with. Uh, there were a couple of attempts, failed attempts in the past, but Paul actually brought uh, uh, the whole idea of the possibility of doing psychotherapy 
uh, in Ethiopia. And then by extension, in, and I think since then, there's been a lot of development uh, uh, in the region, the Eastern African region and then the African region. And there is, I think, a direct and indirect influence of Paula coming and bringing uh, uh, this to Ethiopia. This is a very important, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this because it's very important uh, in terms of understanding the context. We're talking about 2006 and a new residency program. And we only had actually two diagnoses back then. Uh, I sometimes wonder maybe we should have stayed with two diagnoses. Um, and there were few medications. Uh, we still have very few medications and there was no other tool. There was no other tool to help patients with. And uh, IPT just appealed to everyone. Uh, one, because I think uh, Paul has influence in terms of presenting it. And the other is it is relational nature was very intuitively accessible to both us the learners and to our patients. And that made it quite easy for us to, to, to be able to take it up and scale it up and learn from it. Uh, while on that, I think another very important uh, I mean, attribute of Paula is her commitment uh, for pedagogic tools and, and her commitment to use educational theories in her teaching and in practice and her capacity to improvise on the spot. So I remember uh, she came with a prepared slides and there was always a hesitation when you bring something to a place like Ethiopia, whether it's going to be relevant there. And we'll be asked her to give uh, our thoughts. I will say this and that. And then the next time she'll just put it there and we'll see, we see it on the, on the slide. And then we see it on the written documents that eventually these documents will develop into something we both would recognize as ours. You can see the elements of IBT, but you also can see the elements of what we actually thought were relevant in terms of that context. So really being open for her to be being, uh, for her to allow us to actually put in our ideas was very, very uh, unique. And we are grateful uh, for, for that valuation, Paula. And uh, uh, last, of course, is, as many would say, Paula's humility and generosity, both in spirit and action, is I think uh, is beyond words, uh, especially in this dynamic of north to south relationship where opportunity, opportunities for people in the south are not quite open and there are several barriers to come into the global space. Paula has been one of our staunchest advocates in pushing us into the global stage and taking our thoughts and ideas to our work uh, 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 globally. So we are very grateful for that to Paula. Finally, I, one of, I, I like so many things about Paula and I can, I can talk many things, but one of, one of the things I like very much is in all her teachings uh, and, and you can see the artist in her because she likes to use quotes and she would quote like, Shakespeare at one point, parting is such a sweet sorrow. Right? That would be like ending uh, IPT or something. And uh, in one of those sayings uh, she caught, I think she want, at one point she, she caught uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, the end uh, is where we begin. You gave me the book, that's why I remember it. And uh, I think your answer, uh, Steve, for your question's answer is the end is where uh, we begin and we're beginning again with some new phase with Paula. So thank you so much, Paula. That'd be my most favorite job. Um, Dr. Lesh, could you please come up and uh, share your words? Paula, I am just so delighted to have this opportunity. Big, big congratulations on this wonderful achievement. I'm going to make a couple of comments personally and also on behalf of Daisy Singler, who is in Europe right now and regrets very much uh, not being able to be here with you. And I think Daisy and I may represent kind of the generational bookends of your career to date, your career to date, because we know there's going to be another chapter. This is uh, from Daisy Singler. 
uh, the principal investigator on the summit trial that Paula referenced. For those of you who don't know, I often refer to Paula as my academic mum. But it wasn't until this past week that I reflected on how this came to be. I first met Paula in 2009 at Columbia University. I was an eager graduate student who was desperate to learn IPT and probably even more motivated to return to Canada to be with my then boyfriend, our husband. Almost immediately, not only did Paula agree to supervise me, a total stranger who was unaffiliated with U of T. She also introduced me to the department chair at McGill, where I would later transfer to complete my PhD and use learnings from IPT to inform my first research trial. As soon as I graduated in 2015, Paula introduced me to folks at Sinai, leading me to my first job. In 2017, and within a week of joining our department, it was Paula who forwarded me an email from this funder called PCORI and encouraged me, a pretty new faculty member, to just apply. Paula did so with her usual warmth and kindness. PCORI funded the summit trial. In our ongoing perinatal mental health trials, Paula has spent countless hours recruiting, training, and supervising dozens of providers, attending countless summit meetings, and guiding our team to ensure a patient-centered lens and the best care possible. In short, Paula, without you, I'm almost certain that I wouldn't be in Toronto. I probably wouldn't be married, and who knows what would have happened to my career. <laughs> like a parent, Paula, you've always looked out for me, even when I wasn't looking. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to add my own perspective. And uh, it's just been a beautiful, beautiful evening and beautiful comments from the people who have spoken and the chat, which we can see. I want to add that through the, the decades, 20 to 25 years that we have worked together, I've always been struck by your eagerness to take on the biggest challenges and projects often pulling me and others along into research collaborations, publications, textbooks, um, and presentations, uh, exemplified by many of the things you've mentioned, the Mount Sinai Psychotherapy Institute, the Achieving and Sustaining Psychotherapy Effectiveness work, and many, many other presentations that we did all around North America. You have produced an incredible ripple effect through your training and your advocacy, your supervision, collaboration, and uh, writing. You've influenced care for countless individuals through your psychotherapy reach. I'm one of those people who believe that even though psychotherapy itself may be intensive, it is uh, one of the best deals in healthcare because of the enormous ripple effect that follows from providing good care. Your work has been focused on enhancing access, mending the implementation gap, mending the quality gap, and your work has been remarkable. At your core, a choreographer, you translate ideas into action with thought, creativity, an unmatched energy. And I would add that the end of project celebratory meals have had the best food and wine. <laughs> I'm so happy for you, Paula, for you, your family, for us, this department. Congratulations on a remarkable career and we look forward to the next chapter. Thank you so much. That, that brings us to the close of the formal event, um, you know, Paula, I hope you've been able, once your cortisol came down a little bit to really feel the affection and the admiration in the room. Um, I'm sure I speak for all of us. It's been very leavening to be able to hear your story, even for those of us who have offices down the hall. And I'm sure for people who haven't been able to hear as much and are hearing many things for the first time today, it's, it's quite special. So congratulations. 
Um, and I hope you have just a beautiful evening. And I think everyone is very clear this is um, another chapter, another improv awaits you. So um, thank you for what you've done and uh, best wishes for all the things that you will do in the future. Thank you.